afternoon. Uh, thank you all for making it to our conference. I know some of you had long journeys to begin with, and then weather did not make that any better, so we really appreciate you making it. Um, I'm Annabelle Beichman. I'm at the University of Washington, and I'm one of the organizers. Um, this uh, session is really near and dear to my heart. It's all about uh, demographic modeling, and this is something I've done a lot of in things from humans to sea otters, and I'm always fascinated to see the new techniques that are developed and how it gets applied to this fascinating range of species. So we're going to be hearing about woolly mammoths and hunter-gatherers and white-tailed deer and fin whales and all sorts of amazing uh, questions uh, in this session. Um, we are going to have a bit of a schedule shuffle. One of our speakers, Sergio Nigan Morales, got caught in those storms yesterday, so he is not able to make it. He is frantically trying to record a talk for us, and we're hoping he gets it in in time by the end of the session. Otherwise, we'll you know have it on perhaps Friday morning or some other time, but we'll see how we do with that. So um, instead, the order of talk we're first going to have Dr. Mariana Dahaska uh, speak to us, and then Dr. Shamalika Gopalan, and then we'll have a coffee break, and we'll come back for Aaron Schaefer's talk, and hopefully also Sergio's recorded talk, fingers crossed. Um, so yeah, let me introduce uh, our first speaker without further ado. So Dr. Mariana Dahaska is uh, about to speak to us. Uh, she just finished her doctorate at Stockholm University in Sweden, and we're thrilled to have her here to tell us about temporal dynamics of woolly mammoth genome erosion prior to extinction. So yeah, Mariana, would you like to come up? Let's make sure you get set up here. Okay, thank you. Should be firing up. This is low on batteries. So <laughs> not off. too many clicks, not too many yeah. pointing. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> 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 Only a 41 slice. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me and uh, the wonderful organization so far. Um, so usually i only get like 10 minute slots um today i get to talk a bit longer which i'm super excited about because then i get to do something i usually don't really get to do at uh conferences or symposium which to actually show you a bit like um what ancient DNA looks like behind the scenes, how we get our samples, what they look like, what ancient DNA lab work looks like. So the hunt for ancient remains. Um, so I work on woolly mammoths, um, which are relatively well preserved. I think of the ancient animals, they're probably one of the most studied. And the reason for that is, apart from the fact that they're big and charismatic, they're also well preserved. And that's because they um, used to live in regions that are very cold. So here you can actually see a section of permafrost, uh, which is basically just frozen soil. Um, so basically these mammoths, once they died, they got frozen um, and now we are starting to in covering uh, this frozen world. Um, so as you see, sometimes tusks just appear from the ground um, where we can pick them up. Um, what I usually do get to work with are not these beautiful tusks like you saw on the, the first slide. Instead, they tend to be like these small shardy things which are quite annoying to sample. Um, or um, here you see my, my former supervisor, Luva, um, cutting a small piece. Um, and those are the ones I usually get into the lab. Um, another way we start to get more samples, um, I'm not going to go too much into the, the ethics of this, um, is by so-called tusk hunters. So these are people um, that literally go to Siberia with big water hoses and then start to make uh, tunnels um, under, under the ice. Um, and when doing so, they're mostly interested in the tusks, the ivory, because it is worth a lot of money. Um, trading mammoth ivory is legal because they're an extinct species. Um, trading elephants um, is, that's illegal. So mammoths are legal. <laughs> you got me. Um, and so the things we then uncover are quite amazing. So this is a mammoth foot that they literally uh, got from the ice. Um, so this was a mammoth that was found in the pit. So they named him Brett, <laughs> the pit mammoth. <laughs> I have nothing to do with this. Um, this mammoth, so maybe it's hard to see. This, this is like an, an ear and then you, you see the eye a little bit on the right. Um, so this one, mammoth apparently had like a beautiful mullet. So they named named him Chris Waddle, which I think is a Canadian ice hockey player, I don't know. Uh, then turned out to be a female, so now we have Christina Waddle. <laughs> um, this is Spartak, which is um, a cave lion cub. Um, amazingly well preserved. Um, Luva describes it as that it looks like it just like had a, a cave lion coming out of the tumble dryer. <laughs> 
Um, and then this is Dogor. Dogor was quite famous when he was found. Um, I think he's around 18,000 years old. And what makes him so interesting, apart from the fact that he was obviously a good boy, um, <laughs> is that um, he was probably, uh, or, or for a long time, they thought that this was one of the first domesticated dogs. Turns out it's probably still a wolf, but a pretty cool find anyway. Um, and this is where I do my magic, or I like to believe I'm doing magic. So this is our ancient lab, clean room. Um, we take a lot of precautions like um, wearing uh, this weird kind of, of space suits is what we call them, face mask, double pair of gloves. Um, the lab is also overpressured. We clean it a lot with a lot of bleach. Um, we don't do that to protect ourselves from the samples, but to protect the samples from us. Um, there's very little DNA in these samples, even though I just said that they're amazingly preserved. It's very little compared to uh, modern samples. So we really want to avoid contaminating these samples. Um, and then I thought I'd briefly go to um, the challenges that come with working with ancient DNA. Um, so here I just made like two figures, one with how I imagine modern DNA looking at, long beautiful fragments, everything you would want. And then you have ancient DNA which is very fragmented because you have um, damage building up in there. Uh, there's a lot of post-mortem damage and this damage typically occurs at the ends of the DNA fragments. Um, and then arguably the, the biggest problem is contamination. Contamination can happen from people handling the samples in the field, uh, but also from like bacteria in the soil, uh, basically all kinds of stuff, um, which makes it very tricky to work with. Um, and I made a little figure of all my mammoth samples, so you can see their endogenous content or like the amount of DNA mapping to, we use a, an elephant reference, and then each line represents one mammoth sample. And you can see that um, some of these samples actually have quite nice endogenous content. I think our best one is around 90%, um, awesome. But then this big tail here represent uh, mammoth samples with less than 1% endogenous content, which is mostly what I'm working with. Um, and the way we work is we typically start with screening runs, uh, which means that we just dump a lot of uh, different mammoths on one uh, lane. We screen them and then we can really cherry pick the nicest ones. So that's basically what I've been doing for four or five years during my PhD. Um, and now we're mainly sequencing now on the NovaSeq and uh, this is relatively cheap because a lot of it is funded by a Swedish government, by SciLife Lab uh, to be specific. So that was a bit of the background. I will now talk about what I really love talking about, uh, woolly mammoths. So woolly mammoths um, used to be one of the most widespread animals during the last ice age. Here you can see their distribution. Um, during their heyday, um, they lived in Europe, um, Eurasia, and even the northernmost parts of North America. Uh, but then the climate started to change, as probably most of you know. Um, and basically uh, by around 12,000 years ago, the Younger Dries, we can see that mammoths were mostly confined to the northernmost parts um, of Eurasia. So what probably happened is that as it got warmer, um, populations shifted more, more and more northwards. And then by around 10,000 years ago, mammoths were mostly um, gone from the mainland. They did, however, survive into the Holocene on two islands that we know of. Uh, one of those is St. Paul Island, which is a small island um, near Alaska. And the other one um, is Wrangell Island, is the island I'm mainly going to talk about today, uh, which you can see here. It's in northeastern Siberia, and their mammoths survived for about 6,000 years um, in isolation. We think they became trapped there due to rising sea levels um, until they went extinct about 4,000 years ago. And this at least based on actual remains, is probably their final extinction day too. So this is just a few uh, pictures of Wrangell Island, what it looks like. So you can see there's a lot of mammoths there. Again, tusks just sprouting from the ground. Um, but it's quite interesting because this is in no way a, a big island. Also, you can see there are no really big trees or bushes. So vegetation-wise, it seems that there were mostly small flowers. Um, there hasn't been that much research yet on um, what Wrangell Island looked like the past 10,000 years, but based on one pollen study, it seems that it was actually um, basically the same. Um, 
for quite some long time. And so um, mammoths lived there for 6,000 years. Carrying capacity has been estimated to be well below 1,000 individuals, meaning that we probably had a very small um, woolly mammoth population living on these islands that then find eventually went extinct, and we don't really know why. One of the um, reasons we think they could have gone extinct is because of the um, this model here, the extinction vortex, where we think that basically um, what this says is that once you have a small isolated population, like for example the mammoths on, on Wrangell Island, um, is that you will have an accumulation of inbreeding, loss of genetic diversity, which will also translate um, in their fitness being lower, again resulting in even smaller populations, etc. So basically this model states that once you have a population that becomes too small is basically doomed uh, to go extinct. Uh, one of the things we wanted to know is whether this happened in the um, Wrangell Island woolly mammoths. Maybe that's the reason uh, why they went extinct about 4,000 years ago, specifically on that island. Um, and there were a few things um, we looked at in, uh, in particular. We looked at heterozygosity. Um, so predictions important here is that time goes from... Um, on the right is old, to the left is uh, present day. So heterozygosity we expect to go down in our population, inbreeding to go up, and then mutation load also to increase over time because we have strong drift, which might um, overwhelm or reduce the efficiency of selection. Um, these are the mammoth samples we used. I will guide you to the figure because I realize it may not be super intuitive. Um, this wobbly line here is basically um, the climate curve, shows how temperature changed uh, through time. Here we have a mammoth sample which is about 50,000 year old. Here we have the mammoths on Wrangell Island after it became separated from the mainland. So our Holocene uh, Wrangell Island population, all colored in purple. And then we have other mammoths from uh, basically the place to see um, what we call the, the mainland population. So you can see there is one mammoth from Wrangell Island here, but it's about 20,000 years old, so we still consider it part of the mainland population, because that's when Wrangell Island was still part of the mainland. Um, as you can see, it's, it's quite a, a nice um, data set sample through time. Uh, what we did here is we processed it with the Gina Road pipeline. So this is a pipeline that was also developed um, in our group. And the nice thing here is that it has two tracks. It has one track for historical or ancient DNA, one for modern DNA so that you can process your samples at the same time and then compare uh, changes in heterozygosity in breeding over time. Um, I don't really work with the modern track. I can't tell you much about that, but if you're interested in it, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. And then very important, I will get back to this later, is that all samples were downsampled to 9.5x genome-wide coverage, um, because that was the coverage of the, the sample with lowest coverage in our data set. Um, so lots of genetic diversity. What do we see? Um, here again, you see the mainland mammoths, here you see the mammoths on Wrangell Island, and you can see that there is quite a drastic drop in heterozygosity, as expected when a population becomes trapped on an island. But then if you zoom in on the mammoths on Wrangell Island, um, we still see a bit of a decrease over time, which is to be expected when you have a close population. Um, but it's, it's a very small decline. It actually seems purely based on heterozygosity that this population was quite stable. So to look a bit more into this, we also ran some simulations to see what kind of numbers do we actually expect to see these differences, the big bottleneck, but then also the relatively constant diversity over time. Um, and there we found that um, the bottleneck, the, the effective population size, whatever that way mean, uh, was probably around eight. Um, but then we had a fast recovery of uh, 10 to 20 generations. Um, and then the effective population size, size after the bottleneck was probably around two to 300 mammoths, which is also consistent with um, the ecological carrying capacity, uh, but also previous estimates on, for example, mitochondrial DNA. It's always nice to see that your results make sense. Um, next thing we looked at was inbreeding, and more specifically, we looked at runs of homozygosity. So these runs of homozygosity are stretches in the DNA um, that are absent of heterozygosity. And the nice thing here is that in these runs, the, the size basically tells you something about when inbreeding happens. If you have very long stretches or very long runs, uh, that means that um, inbreeding happened quite recently. Um, if they're very short, if they're chopped up by recombination, 
combination that means that inbreeding happened in the past or with distant, very distant uh, relatives. Um, and again, here you see that the runs of homozygosity are a lot higher on the Wrangel Island population compared to the mainland population, as expected. But then if we look specifically or, or look at different sizes of runs of homozygosity, um, then we see maybe a more interesting pattern. So these are the, um, what we arbitrarily called short runs of homozygosity, medium and long. And what's very striking to me here is that the long runs of homozygosity actually go down over time. So it actually seems that this woolly mammoth population that went through this massive bottleneck actually on Wrangel Island itself managed to avoid inbreeding. So those were more demographic. Um, uh, parameters, maybe the population was still accumulating a lot of deleterious mutations over time and that caused their extinction. Um, so uh, we looked at that next. So here you see two figures. You have high impact mutations, which are mostly um, uh, Blah. stop codons and frame shift mutations, that's how we classified it here. And then we also have moderate impact mutation or non-synonymous mutation. Um, and we see that they are actually quite different. So our high impact mutations actually decrease over time, showing that there was ongoing purging most likely in this population. And then for the moderate impact, we see the opposite, they increase over time, showing on the other hand, the reduced efficiency of selection. Uh, but then again, the, the mutations in the last mammoths are still not higher than what we see on the mainland mammoths. So overall, what we see is that these mammoths indeed went through a massive bottleneck. Um, but then it seems that the population actually remained stable um, after the bottleneck, um, demographically wise at least. Um, we do see a decrease in highly deleterious mutations pointing to purging, um, but also an increase in slightly uh, deleterious mutations. Okay, this is the second, secret second part. Um, so maybe people who are a bit interested in mammoth research or, or just in general um, may say like, well, Mariana, what you said is very interesting, but I really remember this study that said exactly the opposite. Um, they found an excess of genomic defects in a woolly mammoth on Wrangell Island. So this is a previous study that was published in 2017. Um, they looked at a lot of different things in two mammoths, um, which we also used in our study. Uh, the one here, that's Omiakon, based on where it was found, it's about 45,000 years old. And then um, here they call it Wrangell, it's about 4.3 thousand years old. It's also the, the youngest mammoth in this data set. Um, they looked at a lot of different things like deletions, um, retrogenes, but one of the things they also looked at is stop codons, um, what we in our study classified as high impact mutations. Um, and what they found is that the Wrangell Island mammoth had a lot more high impact or stop codons than the Omiakon mammoth. Um, and in my data set, they're, they're actually pretty much the same. Um, so I've been breaking my head around this for a very long time, spent a lot of time doing my PhD wondering like what's what's the difference? What did I do wrong? Or, or what did they do wrong? Or why, wh why do we find this difference? And I think one of the main things that we did different in our study is the downsampling. So if you look at these two samples, uh, the Wrangell Island mammoth has about 17x coverage, whereas the Omiakon mammoth has about 11x. Uh, so very different coverage. Um, then I went back to my original mammoths without the dam sampling, looked at um, the loss of function mutations as a function of number of sites or basically coverage. And there you can actually see a very nice correlation. So basically point I'm trying to make is the more, the higher your coverage, the more loss of function mutations you find. So this is something important to account for. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about it since then I even, um, this is still work in progress, but um, our highest coverage moment is about 30x. Um, Christina Waddle, which you may remember, um, the boring name, Yak Inf, um, means Yakutia Infinidate. Um, and I basically repeated some sort of downsampling experiment starting from 30x coverage down to um, 10, looked at heterozygosity, and I was actually quite surprised that even at higher um, coverage, you still could really see the difference. So I think this is definitely something important that we can, as a community, look better into, especially in the field of ancient DNA, where we try to compare our species, try to 
break the record for for lowest heterozygosity or whatnot um, to basically be aware that a lot of these comparisons are different or difficult because of difference in coverage but also filtering so finally i would like to acknowledge the people in stockholm who are horrible at taking group pictures um, <laughs> and of course the the mama team luva dalian my former supervisor um, and all the other people thank you Thanks. Uh, great talk. Really, really fascinating. Uh, these results. I was kind of wondering if you can elaborate a bit on the uh, medium impact um, mm -hmm. uh, mutations. I, I get the thing with like the stop code on. Yeah, you yeah, probably yeah. can assess that they are high impact. But I'm, I'm wondering what would you consider like a medium impact when you don't can't really measure what it does. I know. I, this is actually, I think, one of the trickiest thing uh, to do is to predict what exactly a mutation does. Um, so here specifically, I used a software that basically tries to predict the, the, the effect of mutations. Um, so it looks at stop codons, looks at non-synonymous mutations, and then it also has like intergenic regions, which it basically considers um, almost neutral. Um, so this is definitely the trickiest uh, thing to do, to do, I think. Um, I would say it's not because it's classified as uh, medium impact that it really is medium impact. So I think, um, yeah, this is where we could use a lot of, of improvements, especially in this field with non-reference uh, species. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, great talk. So I was curious, uh, you talked about differences in uh, depth, mm -hmm. but uh, were there differences in coverage? I'm, I'm just wondering, because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can see how it might be that differences in depth might lead to increased discovery of stop codons, but yeah, yeah. maybe there was also differences in sorry, in depth, but in coverage, what proportion of the genome was actually yeah, covered? Yeah, of course. I think this is also one of the trickiest thing, and you have to find a balance between completely filtering out any form of variation and still, um, like, kind of having, treating every sample uh, similarly. So basically, coverage is calculated as, um, yeah, genome-wide wide coverage, excluding repetitive regions. And then for depth, we do use quite stringent filters where we want, or at least for a field of engineering, where we want at least every site to be covered or have a depth of six. Um, yeah, and then there's a lot of other filters we do too, yeah. So I would just be curious to see whether there were specific uh Mm -hmm. You found new stop codons, or I mean, I didn't actually look the details very specific of the sites, into yeah. what Might kind of codons is. Yeah, so that's that's um, something for the next uh, PhD student. Yeah, to really look into like what what are these uh, mutations we're talking about? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Uh, hey, I was wondering if you have looked at any enrichment cata categories for LOF mutation, uh, those loss of function mutations. Are like um, no, no. That, so that's something I, I, I haven't done yet. Uh, so I, I know there are mutations, but I don't know what these mutations are. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk. So I think um, this might be more of a philosophical question, maybe. <laughs> but uh, I think I read one a few years ago that the last mammals weren't extinct kind of at the same time as the first um, documentation of humans coming mm -hmm. to the island. Yeah. So after five years of looking at the genetics behind it, would you be able to kind of speculate how much was actually due to humans hunting or if they would have been become extinct anyways if we would have left the <laughs> island untouched that is a very tough question if it's even possible to speculate so on on Wrangell island we know that humans arrived after the mammoths went extinct i think um we we have some recordings of, of dates but also if humans were hunting mammoths on Wrangell island we would have found like cutting marks and stuff like that so we don't see that on the mainland it's a, a bit more tricky um i mean what, what we know is is that there have always been signs cycles of, of, of warm and cold climates um, and, and mammoths so far always managed to, to bounce back. So um, is this cycle different? Well, it's, 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 it's very warm. Holocene has been consistent for a very long time. Um, my personal 
So based on genetics, I don't think we can really tell whether humans cause it. But I think my personal opinion is that probably the changing climate caused these very small isolated populations and humans probably were the, yeah, the, final, the final blow to that population. Thank you. One more? Yeah, so that was a great talk. Um, I, I, it wasn't clear uh, uh, one result regarding the size of the bottleneck. Did you say it was eight animals and then they rebounded to 300? Yeah, that like effective infinite? population size, yeah. yeah. But what would have happened? I mean, if they were isolated in an island and the size of the island remained the same, I mean, why would they have decreased so much and then come back to 300? Why not just stay at 300, which is the size, the carrying capacity of that island if they were already there? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just rising sea levels. Yeah, so mammoths, um, so, so Wrangell Island, maybe if, if you get from the picture, it's, it's, it's not an ideal environment for mammoths. So they, we find some mammoths there throughout the Pleistocene, uh, but they probably were not living there permanently. Permanently. So what we think happened is that as the sea levels rose, um, they actually just became trapped on the island because it was higher than the surrounding um, uh, surrounding mainlands. Um, and from the mitochondrial DNA, we, for example, know that it was probably only um, one herd or one mitochondrial lineage that got trapped on that island, uh, which would explain why they were so bottlenecked initially. Got it. On for now, uh, but save questions for the coffee break. Thank you, Mary. It was wonderful.